Now some slides. So while we're waiting for this, oh, there they are. Okay. All right. So hello, everyone. My name is Hugh McKee. I work for a company called Lightbend. Anybody heard of Lightbend before? Some? Um, anybody heard of Scala? We're the company behind the Scala programming language and, and some other things. But today, I'm really here to talk to you about seven reasons why microservices should, why your microservice should use event sourcing and CQRS. So how many people are familiar with event sourcing and CQRS? Some, OK. Good. Well, um, I'll give you kind of an introduction and maybe some justification. My motivation here is to give you some justification for using it, because often, as you'll see as we go through the talk, this is a different way of doing things with uh, how you set up microservices. And, and sometimes change is difficult to get implemented. Uh, another motivation, though, is for building systems, especially microservice systems, that are more robust. And that's something I'm very passionate about. So as we've, I've said in a number of talks this morning, and it's been interesting, and, and one of the themes is um, you know, moving from what we call the monolith and now microservices, and then you've, you've probably heard of a few people talk about serverless as well. But in a way, what we're doing is you know, we've been building large and complex systems typically with, mi with monoliths for actually decades. And now, you know, for the last four or five years or so, microservice popularity has grown. And then now, you know, we're going into serverless. But basically, we're building large, and, you know, we build large and complex systems using monoliths, and then we replaced it by building large and complex systems using microservices. And now we're moving into building larger, or not larger, but large and complex systems with serverless. But there are some common denominators there. And, you know, with a, these large and complex systems, you know, we often focus on the code, uh, but we don't necessarily focus on the data, the persistence layer. And there's opportunities there for change in the way you do persistence that, and this is really what I want to talk about here. So there's, you know, there's the processing part of a system, which, you know, it used to be monoliths and, and still is in many cases, which is fine. I'm not saying anything bad about monoliths. You know, they definitely have their place, they're well known, we know how to build them, we've got a lot of experience. But then there's a lot of interest and in, in growing popularity of my, my, uh, microservices and, and now serverless. But there's not just the processing part, but there's a persistence part, the storage part. And really, in this talk, we're going to be looking at you know, this command query responsibility se segregation. CQRS is command query responsibility segregation. And it really is kind of splitting things apart at the persistence level. So what we're talking about is often with microservices, people will split up the code, but they don't split up the data. So you have a monolithic system that you break apart at the code level, but you also have a monolithic database that maybe or maybe not you break up at the database level. And often, that's the one that's much more difficult to do. Uh, my experience has been in the enterprise space. I, I worked at HP Hewlett Packard for a long time, and I was in IT there. And you know, the databases were owned by the DBAs, the, you know, the database administrators, and you know, they had their ways of doing things. And it, getting them to change could be could be fun. But a couple of things I like to think about when, um, in like, I, I go to a lot of conferences and speak, and I, I get a chance to meet a lot of people. And in any discussion that I, I get a chance to have a, a talk with somebody about how they're doing microservices, I usually ask three, three. I'm looking for like for three criteria. These aren't rules; it's just kind of kind of criteria. So the first one, which is usually easy if you're doing microservices, is that the code is independently deployable, meaning that. If I, you and I are, say, on one microservice team and, and these other folks are on another microservice team, that we can deploy to production on our own speed and scale, you know, whenever we, we need to. We're not hooked in at the code level with some other team. You know, that's the goal is to be, have that, you know, that loose coupling at the code level. But the next part I'm really interested in, especially when you're looking at from event sourcing CQRS, is does the microservice own its own schema? 
And that's where things get interesting because I've talked to people where it's like, oh, no, we can't break up the database. Um, it, you know, it's, it's been around for a long time. It's, it's all designed. Everything's set up. Other teams own it. We can't do it. But there, what I want to hope to show you here is that there's big advantages for doing this. And it, kind of, it all kind of falls under the category of loose coupling. You want to be nimble. Each microservice, you want it to be nimble where you can make changes on your own speed, your own decisions with as little influence as possible. The other thing is that you want your microservice to be kind of a, it has, it's a black box. You know, so it, there's a, a look to it on the outside that the, everybody else sees, but you as, a, you as a team, say, that's developing the microservice, you know what it looks like on the inside, but the inside is private. What it looks like on the inside, even at the data level, should be private to you. Your, your, only, um, your only view of the microservice on the outside is through APIs. So these are kind of, I mean, these are not the only things about microservices, but these are three characteristics that I think are really interesting to kind of ask yourself. Say when you're talking to somebody else that's doing microservices, maybe in the course of the conversation, see if they, you know, how they answer these three questions. You know, is it independently deployable? Does it own, own its own schema, which is, in my experience, has been fairly rare, and API-only access to the data. Now, like I said earlier, um, when you propose this, often people think that you're crazy, you know, that the world's going to end. You can't do this. You're splitting up data. It's like, oh, my God, what are you thinking of? This is, you know, you're nuts. I'm, we're not going to do this. But... This is why I wanted to do these seven reasons. So to start, though, I'm going to kind of walk through seven reasons, but I added a, a, a zeroth reason you know, just to kind of show you an overview of what um, event sourcing in CQRS is. It's actually fairly straightforward. So I've got this, um, these, these seven reasons, but the, the one that, that I want to show you is this, this first one is this diagram here. So this is basically kind of the breakdown, where you've got, say, your, this is, say, the microservice on the inside. And you've got a client of some kind, it really doesn't matter in the, in the discussion here, that's sending in requests to do, you know, for the microservice to do something. Well, the requests come in, and it's, the, the requests are treated as either a, a, a command, which is an action to, to perform some kind of a state change in the microservice. You know, you're going to, this request comes in, and, and as a result, the microservice is going to change some data. Or it could be a request just to retrieve some data. So it's just kind of a read-only type of thing. But they follow two, two different paths. If it's a command, the, it, this is the command part of the, of the command query responsibility segregation. The command part is an intent to do something. It hasn't happened yet, so it's, it's kind of phrased in a future tense. Please add this item to my shopping cart, for example. It hasn't happened. Now, a command is taken in, it's verified, you know, is this a legitimate command? Can I, you know, is this allowed to, to be done? It goes through the normal processing. But then the outcome of this is that there's an event. And an event is a historical statement of fact. It's an it's a immutable statement of fact. It's something that's happened in the past. Because as soon as we, say, add an item to the cart, it's item added, you know, past tense. So it, we, you know, this, you, this customer added this item to the shopping cart at this time. You know, it's, it's something like that, and that's what gets stored. So the event sourcing part of event sourcing in CQRS is that the events are stored as is in a simple data structure. It's like a key value pair. So an event has some kind of a key, which is like, you know, say the, the shopping cart ID, and a timestamp or you know, other pieces of information, and then, and then it's the actual action, what, what actually transpired. This is all that's getting stored in the event side, in the, what's called the event store. The, the reason for this is that it's really fast, right? It's a very simple data structure. You're just doing inserts, insert, 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 insert. That's it. No updates, no deletes. So for example, say um, in a shopping cart, in a CRUD approach, you know, create, read, update, delete, Say we add an item to the cart, and then we remove the item from the cart. Well, the end result is the cart doesn't have that item in it anymore. With an event sourcing type of an approach, 
there would be an event for adding the item into the cart, and then there would be another event for removing the item from the cart. So you basically have historical record that aggregates to the current state of the order. You can recover the state of the order by replaying all the events. So you have all that data, which is kind of interesting, especially now that data science is getting really important and, and data is important. And things like having what I've heard has been called as negative data, like removing an item from a cart, which we would have thrown away in a kind of a CRUD approach, is now part of the event store, which can be fed downstream maybe to some analytics stage, you know, some you know, machine learning or you know, whatever the, you know, the data science would like to do it. Because often it's more interesting to find out why was an item removed from a cart versus why did they buy the item in the first place? Why, are they, why is this item not being purchased? Why is it being put into the cart and then taken out? That information now is available. Now, the next part, though, is that the, this event needs to be propagated to um, what's called the read side. So the write side is the event store, and the read side is for queries. So the idea here is this is the separation, where you could use a database for, say, Cassandra for, for, doing, for storing the events, because it's just you know, slamming in event, 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 a real simple data structure. On the other hand, though, on the query side, it could be your favorite database for queries. So it could be SQL, it could be uh, Elasticsearch, it could be a graph database, it, you know, whatever makes sense for the types of queries that this service is, uh, is designed to provide. And as you'll see, another opportunity is that you're not constrained to a single query database. Because we're going to implement something where you have reliable, absolutely reliable messaging between the right side and the read side, because these are split. If it's, a, say, Cassandra on the right side and MySQL or Postgres are on the read side, those are two separate transactions. There's a, there's a, this is where the segregation part exists between the two sides. So when a query comes in, this is just handled as a simple query, but now it goes to the read side, and the query goes to a database that maybe isn't even, you know, it's not necessarily normalized for, uh, in the way we have done in the past. Because the this read side databases or read side databases are set up to do queries specifically designed for this, for this service. So this is kind of a very quick overview of what CQRS is. And event sourcing is a, is a way of persisting data on the right side with CQRS. So when you hear about event sourcing in CQRS, th this is one of the, my favorite diagrams that I've seen to, to kind of explain it. So there's, again, there's a right side where it's, you're just handling the events getting stored very, very quickly, very fast. And then there's a read side, which is optimized for the query part. And they're split. So let's get into reason number one of the seven, and kind of starting at the design phase. Now, often, and I, you know, I'm an architect, a developer, so I'm usually downstream of this. But often, what happens is that you know, the, you, many of you may have already participated in this, doing some form of domain-driven design. The other part that I really like is I think I find much more intuitive is what's called event storming. And with event storming, the idea is that you get the development team, you get the management in, you get, and especially you get the business team, and you throw them all into a room with a bunch of with markers and post-its, and you say, think about the events that this system creates. What does this system do from an event perspective? So it's kind of like, and you're kind of thinking of commands and events. So the exercise is you do domain-driven design and event storming, and the outcome of that exercise, and I'm really simplifying this, but the outcome of the exercise is you're identifying the candidates for your microservices in the system, and more importantly for this talk, you're also identifying kind of the, grand, the more fine-grained, what are the events that occur in, say, handling an order or handling uh, you know, uh, customers, you know, those types of things. And that kind of, what I like is it flows very smoothly into, all right, we're thinking about events. Everybody's been thinking about events, not just the development team, but the business team as well. This is, so you kind of have an event mindset going, which flows very, very nicely, I think, to building systems that are event-oriented when you're doing event sourcing in CQRS. So it's a nice way to kind of um, 
introduce the technology of event sourcing and CQRS or the architecture into um, the design phase. But more dear to my heart is the whole thing of um, re reducing service coupling. So the idea here is that I just want to show uh, a quick example, but say we've got three, a couple of services here. And the typical flow is, and I've seen this in earlier talks today, you say you have service one wants to retrieve some data from service two. So it does you know, a request, maybe an HTTP request, and it gets a response. One of the things that I really hope that you walk away from this talk is that think about what will go wrong. What's going to wake you up on a Sunday morning at 3 o'clock? The, the reason this is such, such an important thing to me is that for years, I, I had to suffer doing production support. I was a developer, but when our app went down, the phone rang, right? Or I got messages, or, you know, we, were, we had to fix it. And it was, you know, even if there was a support team, more often than not, they very quickly went, oh, I don't know what's wrong with this thing. We got to call the developers. And bang, you know, 3 o'clock on a Sunday morning, 3 o'clock on a Saturday morning, the worst possible time. You got plans for the whole weekend, and it's shot because you're stuck on a call because your system's down. I'm very sensitive to, to this. So I'm hoping that you guys walk away with thinking about not, don't use the word if. I always tell people, don't use the word if this will happen. Use the word when this will happen. Because if it can happen, it will happen, right? So things break. So think about it. So what's going to break here, right? Well, if service two goes down, that cascades into service one. So... Is that an acceptable scenario or not? If it is, then fine, go with this approach. But when it's not, when you don't want one service dragging down the whole system, then you need to start thinking of other alternatives. Let's look at another scenario where it's a little bit more interesting. Say service one is an order service, and service three is a customer credit service. Let's just walk through the scenario. So say service one, when an order is placed, the order goes into a new, state, uh, a new order state, okay? And then it talks to, and I'm not going to say how, but it's going to the, the communicate with service three to say, hey, a new order has been created. Now, when that happens, when service three sees a new order, what it does is a credit check, right? So it does a credit check. So it executes a transaction. And maybe it reserves some credit, okay? So that's transaction number two. Two distinct, separate da you know, database transactions happening in a distributed systems across two, two microservices. Then when service three does the credit check, it, it responds with, yep, credit approved or credit rejected, which causes the order service to do another transaction. Maybe if, if the credit was approved, the order goes from new to approved. And then the order goes you know, through the shipping flow and everything. But What's happened here is that we just did three transactions, separate transactions in a distributed environment in a monolith that probably was done in a single transaction. Now you move into a microservice environment and, and it's, you've got this distributed situation. So again, ask yourself, what's going to go wrong here? And it's plenty. You know, there's a lot of things that will go wrong. The network is going to drive you crazy because when you start messaging across distributed systems, in my experience, it's like it works great for a while, but every once in a while, something happens for a few minutes where messages don't go through, timeouts happen, circuit breakers pop, and then you get alerts or you, know, some, you find out about it later, and then you go look, and everything's fine. The, the network's fine again. It's like, what the heck's going on? But it's just kind of like a fact of life. The, the network is, is just isn't always reliable. It gets more interesting, though. Say Service 3 received the request, and before it can handle that request, though, it goes down. That's going to happen as well. Even more interesting, Service 3 did the work that it was supposed to do, is trying to tell Service 1 that it did the work, and the network breaks again. So now Service 1 doesn't know if what Service 3 has done yet. It, you know, the, the order service doesn't know what the customer credit service has done. It doesn't know if it's processed it. All it knows is it never received any response. The order is stuck in a new state. How do you recover from that? And just to you know, add insult to injury, you know, serve, you know, say the request gets all the way back to service one before it can process it, it goes down. Now remember, you know, like we, I don't know if you guys said in on the, um, the Istio talk this morning, which I thought was really, really interesting, 
And one thing that's going on there is the services are coming and going all the time, even when things aren't breaking, even when things are shutting down. Now, the lifespan of services in this new distributed world, like running in Kubernetes and stuff, is extremely short. I've heard things like the lifespan of a, of a Docker container running in a, you know, like a Kubernetes environment is measured in like hours or days. You know, it's, it's not a long time. So these services are constantly coming and going. And they could be in the middle of trying to do all this work and they go away. So how do we bridge these gaps? How do we in, introduce some reliability? Well, going back to this diagram that I showed earlier, We've got a similar situation between events going into the event store, and we need to make sure that every single event on the, that's going into the right side goes into the read side. So how do we do that? Well, one approach that you're going to be seeing over and over here is that it, a pull approach. So often our intuition says, I'm the creator of this event, so I'm responsible for pushing it to you. Right, so what do I, all I have to do is I just make that call to the other database. Well, wait a minute. I made a call to Cassandra. That's that's a done transaction. Now I'm trying to make a call to say Postgres. That's another transaction. You're vulnerable because it's in Cassandra, but you've got a period of time before it gets into the read side database. If you get blasted before you get that message over, you've lost that message. And let me tell you, the, one of the worst set of problems I've ever had was having a system where occasionally you drop some messages and the customers find out and the, you know, the business finds out and, every, and your managers find out and everybody's manager is like, are you going to fix this broken message issue? And you look at your architecture and you're trying to figure out where in the heck are, where am I losing all these messages? Then you find it and you realize, oh my gosh, I got a real big problem here. How am I going to plug this hole? It's not a fun place to be. So this is why this kind of pool approach, which is it's the consumer of the messages that's responsible for, for getting it. And this is where the event log comes in, uh, again, very str strongly, because now that we have a log of events on the right side, it's just an offset-based type of thing. Where the consumer is just pulling events based on its own offset. If the consumer goes down, you know, trying to read events, it, um, and when it comes back up, it just picks up where it left off. The producer is not responsible for pushing messages over. So this applied, I should have kind of a replied inside of microservice in between the segregated parts of the right side and the read side, but it also applies to messaging across um, services. So this is the Kafka approach. If, you, if anybody, if any of you have used Kafka, a Kafka consumer does this, where the, con the consumer is pulling messages. It's not the producer pushing messages, OK? But there's some tricky parts to it here that we'll look at. Like this one here, where you know, it, you, often people will say, all right, I've got two services, and, I, you know, and we, I, we need the message between those two services. So yeah, we'll, we'll add Kafka, and everything will be great, right? Well, almost, because the producer still has to somehow get the message into Kafka. And it's the same type of situation. Perform the database transaction, say in my service, and then I need to make that call to Kafka. That's not part of the same transaction. It's that you're vulnerable again. You, if you, once you commit your change to the database and you're trying to make that call to Kafka, if you get blasted, you lost that message. You've got to have a way to recover from it. When you're using the, the pull approach, it's the consumer that's pulling, right? And it, you, you don't have that responsibility on the producer of, of, of having to deal with making sure that everything gets in there when you have these kind of non-transactional splits between things. So part of this is that um, the synchronous approach is very intuitive and it's easier to implement, but it's sometimes, and it's great in many scenarios, but in situations where you cannot afford to lose data, we have to have, you know, at least once messaging delivery, you have to think about 
what am I going to do when this breaks? What am I going to do when that breaks? What, you know, when the network breaks, when the service goes down? Consider all the scenarios. How are you going to recover from it? And often the solution when you really need reliability is a more asynch asynchronous type of an approach. So let's move on. So, so uh, we want to break the, the read versus write performance bottleneck. So typically with, you know, with a single database, we're, we're always kind of a, in a trade-off situation. When you optimize for reads, you're, you're typically adding indexes, which you know, slows down your writes. When you optimize for writes, you're removing indexes, which slows down your reads. So you have to play this balancing game between the two. And this is another area where the segregation of the write side and the read side can come into play, because you've got the write side where it's optimized for writing. You're just capturing data very, very quickly. And then you've got the read side that's optimized for query. And then you've, you've got this synchronization bridge that you have to build between the two. And it's that pull approach where the right side can get ahead and the read side is you know, maybe struggling to keep up, but it will eventually keep up. But the, the, the cost of this is that it's, you have an eventually consistent system, that the view on the right side is the the most up-to-date up view, the view on the read side might be behind. And it, it is by, kind of by design behind because there's, there, there's going to be some latency between the two. So you have to really think hard about, is this form of eventual consistency acceptable for the service that we're implementing? If it's not, then this you know, event sourcing and might, might, uh, not might not be the right thing for what you want to implement. Another one is uh, what I like to call is elevate the concurrency barrier. You know, the, the load on our systems varies. It can be uh, daily, you know, where at times, you know, say overnight, the, the, the traffic to your system is low. And during the day, it's high. Um, when, we were at, when I was at HP, we kind of had three peaks. We had a peak when uh, China, you know, Asia was awake. When the sun was over Asia, we had a peak. And then the sun came over U Europe, and we had another peak. And the sun came over the Americas, and we had a third peak. Then we got a little break while the sun went over the Pacific, and it, you know, changed again. But we saw these peaks. And it could be, you know, like some systems are really busy on the weekends and light on the week, during the week, and it could be the opposite. The real fun ones, though, are these seasonal peaks, uh, seasonal peaks where, you know, say there's some events like, you know, it, 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 you know, the classic one is Black Friday. And um, have you guys heard of Singles Day? Yeah, Singles Day is the, like the biggest shopping day of the year. It's, I think it's uh, November 11th, 11-11. And um, it's a big thing in, in China. It's huge. And, and it's like there's more stuff sold on that one day than anywhere in the world. And it's, you know, so there's a massive spike. So the system has to be able to, to handle this. The, the way I kind of look at database performance, though, is that there's kind of a ceiling. Uh, you know, you can push it so far, and then you push it too far, and it starts to slow down. That's kind of the yellow band here. You push it further into the red zone, and the database gets really mad at you, and it really starts to slow down. And, it, you know, so it could be that maybe during your peak time during the day or the peak time during the week, the system starts to get kind of, you know, gnarly. Users are complaining, you know, things are slowing down, but you could be stuck because, and I've been in this situation where, hey, the performance of the database gets under this load and we're trying to improve it. You go to the DBAs and say, oh yeah, we can fix it. Two weeks later, it's still not fixed. You're kind of stuck between a rock and a hard place. And when you get those big spikes, this is where, I mean, it's, in the last few years, a lot of the big retailers have gotten better, but, Many of you may have seen on, say, Black Friday, how many retailers, it was almost a sport, how many retailers went down because they couldn't handle that spike. It was because their back-end systems couldn't handle the traffic, you know, that big spike in traffic. They couldn't scale up for it. This is another reason where, or place where event sourcing and CQRS can play in, because if your services are built like this, you can have a big spike. And so you're writing very fast to the right side, you know, the events are just going in, event, 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 insert, 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 no updates, no deletes, very simple. And the read side is maybe not capable of keeping up. So there's that gap, the eventual consistency gap may be wider, but if your system is designed to take it, you've effectively raised the concurrency ceiling quite a bit. So 
you know, the, eventually the read site catches up, but you've got to be aware of this when you're, when you're considering using this type of an approach. So back on messaging, you know, uh, reason number five, uh, simplifying hardened messaging. So with messaging, one of the things to think about is, you know, what's called the semantics of delivery. And when you're looking at any kind of messaging that you're using in your systems, think it kind of falls into three categories, at most once, at least once, and exactly once. So at, mo at most once, I like to think of as maybe once, meaning that by design, when you use this approach, some messages will be lost. And if that's okay, that's fine. But just realize that that's the decision that you made, that in certain situations, some messages may be lost. And there's plenty of scenarios where that's perfectly fine. Where it gets most, more fun, though, is that where you do want every single message to get delivered. So there's the uh, at most once, or once or more. So there, the reason I say once or more is that this is the most common, by far, form of messaging where you have reliable messaging is, is um, at most once. I'm sorry, at least once, and the once or more, which means that the consumer may see the same message more than once. So the consumer is going to see every single message, which is you know, very, very important, but the price you're paying is that the consumer might see the same message more than once. So you have to compensate for that. And then there's, there's kind of the, the exactly once, what I, which I like to call essentially once. If you, if you really want to kind of wrap your head around building distributed systems, think about as hard as you can what it would take to do exactly once from the perspective of the producer and the, from the perspective of the, of the consumer. And I'll give you a hint. There's no way the producer can do exactly once because you, there has to be some form of retry because when you, so it's like I send you a message and I'm waiting for an acknowledgement back. Now, again, the, the same f failure scenario is I send you a message and maybe you got the message, but I never heard back. So I wait a bit and I send you a message again. And then you come back and say, yeah, I got it. I thought I told you. And they said, no, you didn't because I didn't receive the acknowledgement. It's that kind of situation. If you really think about it, it's, there's, there's some real challenges in, in messaging across, uh, you know, uh, across the network. There's exactly once on the consumer side, but it, even there, what's happening is that often the scenario is that somebody is deduping the, the duplicate messages before the actual final consumer sees it. So there's a little magic happening you know, somewhere along the line where the consumer only sees one message, but somebody is taking responsibility for deduping the duplicates because it's unavoidable. Even with Kafka, for example, when they announced exactly once, they were very open about the fact that they, um, how they did that. And, and th it's a form of deduping that they implemented. So there's the, the retry loop. If you're, if you're pushing, you got to have some kind of retry loop. Well, guess what? In order to do some kind of retry loop, you got to be able to handle being in the middle of retrying to send messages and you go down and then you come back up, and you got to pick up where you left off. So you've got to have some kind of event log anyways. You're like, what messages are pending to be delivered that haven't been delivered yet? And you're in the middle of trying to deliver them, you're waiting for an acknowledgement back, and you go down. So when you come back up, you got to pick up where you left off. To do that, you need some kind of log of what's, what needs to be sent. I mentioned this before, but this is the one that scares me the most, and I just want to go through it again. When you're pr producing to Kafka, the thing you need to think about is that, especially in a situation where, say, your service, the, the producer has performed some kind of transaction, which is very common in, you know, in whatever database you know, you're going into, and then you're making that call to Kafka. And again, you're in that period of vulnerability between the time it's done, it's in the database, and you have to deliver this to Kafka, and you get whacked. Your service goes down before you make that call to Kafka. I know the period of vulnerability is low, but what's the rule? If it can happen, it will happen, and it will happen at the worst possible time. And this is one of those things where the system's working great, you're sending millions and millions and millions of messages, but you're a jerk 
because every once in a while, your service is dropping a message, and the business is aware of it, and the customers are complaining about it, and it's not a fun place to be. So you have to compensate for it. So this is why uh, this whole pattern of the pull approach versus the push approach uh, works so well, is that you're, you're, you've got a kind of a simpler way of, uh, of getting messages over where you, you know, the, the reader, as I call it here in this diagram, you know, it, it says, All right, I need to read from offset 50. When I read from offset 50, something gets posted to my database, and then I persist that, oh, right, I've done offset 50. And say, you know, say that you post to the database, but then you fail. So when the service comes back up, it says, all right, I've got to read from offset 50 again, right? Because the service doesn't know that, you know, that this happened. So this is the um, once or more type of messaging that you're going to get duplicate messages, but you're not going to drop any messages. That's the key thing. Um, and again, it, you know, I, I think the really important one is you're thinking about it when you're trying to push things, produce things and push it into Kafka. All right, the sixth one is back on coupling, uh, eliminate service coupling. And this is probably one of the most controversial. So say in this hypothetical situation, we've got five services. And in the center is a customer service. So all these other four services need to get information from customers so that they can do their work. So they send in a request, they get a response back. So you've got a form of coupling here. And what will go wrong? Well, the customer goes down. What's going to happen? It cascades to the other services. Guess what? You spend a lot of time and money, and you've built essentially a distributed monolith in this kind of scenario, right? And your micro microservices, we've got another term for them. They're microliths. They're, you know, they're parts of kind of a module of a, of a monolith. You've got, you know, you've got a situation where one service can pull down a bunch of other services. So the, 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 the kind of the controversial approach here is that flip it around. Customer, um, whenever customer makes a change, it publishes, hey, I changed this customer. And if it's using event sourcing, it's, you know, here's an event. Uh, modified the, uh, the mail address, modified the email address, you know, whatever, whatever the change is to customer. So it's just publishing those events. The four other services are consumers of, of those events. Those four other services store their own view of customer on their own side. And that's kind of the big controversial part. It's like, oh my God, you're replicating data. This, high, you know, the, this is heresy. You know, we, replicating data, we don't do that. This is what all databases are for, denormalize, our normalized databases, reduce replication, everything. It's like, no, this is a new world. This is time for change. And this is one approach for, for doing this. Oh, shoot, sorry. Uh, one approach for doing this. So the other part of this is that storage is way cheaper today than it was not too long ago. But we're, you know, it's like, especially for those of us who have been around for a while, we carry forward our own old ideas like, oh, you know, oh, man, we're, you know, you're duplicating data. That means more cost for storage. And it's like, yeah, but you know, storage doesn't cost that much anymore, not like it was not too long ago. Another big advantage is that these services are now decoupled. They're self-contained. And guess what? They run faster. Because when they need customer information, instead of having to reach over the network and get some information back and be vulnerable to the customer service slowing down, the network between your service and the customer service slowing down, the net, you know, things breaking, all those vulnerabilities, all those things that can slow you down or take you down go away because now you're decoupled and when you need to do your work, you just get your own information, that you, your own view of customer, you use it to do your work and you're on your way. Now I know, know this is more complicated, but this is a pattern that more and more people are starting to adopt. And it's kind of done after, um, in many cases, we're, Teams have built their first iteration of microservices, and now they're kind of refining their architecture. And this is an approach that often I'm seeing where you're kind of going through that next big architectural review of how should we orchestrate or how should we implement our microservices, how, how should we architect them. And this is an approach that's starting to be, become common. 
um, but it has huge advantages. The other, just one more final thing on it is that customer changes at a very slow rate. So the read versus write ratio is very high. You read it very, very often, but the write ratio is very, very low. So the number of events that customers are producing that have to be consumed by these other services, you know, the, the rate is very low, so the, the network traffic goes way down and everything, but you know, the cost is duplication of data. But if you have a form of messaging that guarantees that you'll get every single you know, message at least once, you're good. And these types of approaches are, are a possibility. So again, when the service goes down, the other ones keep running. So last reason, and this is kind of a rant on my part. Uh, how, many, how many of you guys work in what you would think of as an enterprise space? Okay, not a lot, man. Okay, you guys are lucky. The ones that aren't in an enterprise space, you're really lucky. Because in, in an enterprise space, um, and maybe where you're working now, there's a kind of a form of governance. And um, I'm not... I don't know. I guess in these kinds of situations, I am a rebel, where the governance has in always kind of, I've seen it as, you know, the intentions are good. You're trying to do things like make sure you do the right thing. But it's a, uh, you're doing things based on guesses and estimations. You know, and so it's like you, you talk about, say, designing your database, designing your schema. And there's a governance committee that's helping you with the design, making sure that everything's set up, a DBA helps you, things like that. Um, or even worse, I've seen it, and I've seen this with customers that I've worked with, you know, they're moving to Kafka, and you've got to go through a laborious process just to get a topic for Kafka. You've got to, you've got to fill out paperwork, you've got to submit it. I've, I've, I've sat in meetings where they've argued about topic names for over an hour, and there's like 20 people on the call, and it's just insane. So this whole idea of reducing governance, the scare is that you, the, the thinking is that you're reducing order, and that introduces chaos. But it's actually quite the opposite. Because when you're reducing the governance, in a way, you're kind of reducing the ceremony and the ritual, but you're you're kind of moving to a form of organized chaos. And what I mean by this is that if, if each one of our microservices is independent, all the way down from the code into the data, and we make a mistake, the blast area of our mistake should be confined inside of our, the black box of our microservice. So if we need to fix it, it should be rel relatively easy to fix. This is the new order of things. When we're in a kind of a monolithic world, especially not only with the monolithic code, but the monolithic data, that's harder to do because, say, if my team screws up the schema that other teams are, are dependent on, the, the blast area could be quite large. So this is the whole thing of trying to kind of push towards not only having the data split, but the, the I'm sorry, the, the code split, but the data split. And it all comes down to wanting to increase velocity, you know, just be able to move fast. We got to move fast. Things are happening quickly that, you know, the demands are you know, going up all the time. And it's just, you know, the governance to me is just a way to, that slows things down. So again, it's a rant. But I love this quote. People are very open-minded about new things as long as they're exactly like the old ones, right? And as a, you know, as a discipline, we can't afford to be like this anymore. We have to be open to trying new things. We have to kind of push the envelope all the time. And, and the fun part, that one of the things I really like about event sourcing CQRS is you're really kind of getting things riled up. You, you're, you're, you're kind of pushing against the grain if it's new to your organization. So these are the seven reasons. Uh, again, I hope uh, it's helped a little bit. I hope you get a little bit better understanding of event sourcing in CQRS. And I hope you kind of take back uh, some justifications for using it. And I hope you kind of walk out of here with kind of the fear of, or, and thinking of, always think about what will go wrong. When you're building a system and you're putting it together, it's easy to do the happy path, but actually, to me, it's more fun. You kind of, I, I kind of th call it throwing rocks at the design. And it's like, you know, you show me a design, and I go, well, well, what happened when that breaks? And then you go, oh, crap. 
you know, so what do we do? It's like, well, let's think about that, and you, you do the redesign. That can be, actually, it, to me, it's, that's a really fun exercise. So it's not kind of like a code review, it's kind of a design, design review. Um, and then the other one is just the, the whole splitting. Splitting of the code, split, and not just the code, but splitting of the data, and even splitting the data inside the, of the services themselves. And then also the, the last part about it, about it is that really, really think about your messaging. And because you don't want to be in a situation where you have to deliver messages, but you've got leaks in your pipes. That, that's one of the worst things that can happen is to have leaks in your pipes. So that's, that's it. Uh, thank you very much. I th think we have a little bit of time for questions, but if not, really appreciate you all sitting in, in on, the, on the presentation.